Now, as we've been saying on in, in our podcast in the text, keep that same energy when you get the word in a few minutes. There's a word that God has for you, and he wants you to be receptive like that. Give us everything you got, okay? So don't, 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 uh, don't shortchange it because we've, we've, we've gone a little long. We want to get everything you have to say. But I'm going to quickly just uh, tell you a little bit more about her for those of you who are familiar with her and for those of you who aren't. Um, Deborah Pagay, uh, Sister Deborah Pagay, from her humble beginnings as a Southern maid to CPA, MBA, to a Fortune 500 VP, to best-selling author, amen, <laughs> global speaker, Bible teacher, and ordained minister, our dear sister Deborah has stood on the Word of God for over 50 years. She has written 18 transformative, inspirational books, including the platinum award-winning 30 Days to Taming Your Tongue. And I really suggest getting that book if you don't have a copy. Over one million sold. And the groundbreaking book, Lead Like a Woman, she has sold over 2.2 million books worldwide. She has appeared on numerous radio, television, and other media platforms. She's hosted her own talk show, Winning with Deborah, on the TBN Salsa Network. A former MCA slash Universal Studios VP, venture capitalist, and mega church CFO and leadership coach, Deborah has played the key role in several newsmaking transitions, including the development of the financial projections for the Magic Johnson National Theater chain. She has enjoyed a rewarding union with her soulmate, Darnell Pagay, for almost 44 years. An eternal optimist, Deborah's life motto is, everything works together for my good, I'm never a victim. Without further ado, let us receive Sister Deborah Pagay. eyelashes off. God is the strength of my life. I'm so reminded of where I've come from. Now, I wasn't going to cry, and I'm not. I don't think I have nothing else to fall off now, so I'm good. God is faithful. God is good. I'm so grateful for his presence in this room. I'm so glad I learned about Jesus early on. I'm so glad I learned about his word. I'm so glad for the leadership of this house. It was Bishop Ed Smith many years ago who asked me a key question. He said, what would you be doing if money weren't the object, just if you could be doing anything? I said, I'd be writing and speaking, but I know I, I, I can't do that. And he challenged me. And through his influence, he got me on a, a national board. And from that, I went to another national board. And I just love the emphasis, Bishop Ed, and to say thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the influence. Thank you for the example of being a man of prayer. And thank you for that wonderful son that you raised. Young man, awesome, intelligent, but with right priorities. We got to thank God for that. Lady Vanessa, I love you. I love you because you are so full of love. No guile in her. I've never heard a gospel about anybody. Just godly people. You know, as far as I'm concerned, this is the hottest ticket in town. It's always center. I'm sorry. It's just the hottest ticket in town to me. Lady Marcy, it's my pleasure to work with you. And you, all of you are so humble. I, I, I recently, and I, don't, I, I guess it's a secret, but it's not a secret anymore, but I recently agreed to lead the women's ministry under the leadership of uh, Lady Marcy. She's so humble. She said, do what you need to do. Just do what you know to do. 
And it's just been a pleasure. I, I have family members here today, but I do want to thank God for the staff, Dory and all of them. Everybody here is so servant hearted. You guys pray for the church staff. I've been a CFO at a church. And it's a lot of work. We have very few people around here doing a lot of work. And I know that we're going to, next Sunday, we're going to be asking you to volunteer. And I'm praying that you will. I'm bringing a message today that I'm hoping that will encourage you to step outside of your comfort zone and do what you need to do. Amen. I, one more. I want to appreciate my family. See that whole row of people right there? Stand up, family, and turn around. Let the people see you. They kind of surprised me. I usually show on the, on, I usually show on the, on the uh, PowerPoint slide a picture of my family, and it's a big family, but I didn't think anybody was coming, so I wasn't going to show y'all their picture. You're going, you got all, all them folks in your family. Didn't nobody come? So there they are. There's my family. I'm so, I so appreciate you for being here. And, of course, my husband of 43.8 years, Darnell Pagay. You know, several, 16 years ago, he said, I believe God is calling you to go out and write and speak and leave your job. I like my job. It was a good job, good pay, good boss. And I said, I don't know if I believe that. I believe God is calling me to keep getting my check. And he said, listen, I got everything. I'll handle it. You go do what God told you to do. I'm, a, I'm just glad for a man who's not so intimidated by what God is doing in my life. That's what I know. That's what I know. How many of you are ready for the word? That's what I like about Zoe. You guys are ready for the word. Father God, in the name of Jesus, we ask that you speak today. Give us a word that will cause us to say yes to you, God, to move from one place to another. Help us to recognize that you are the source of our strength. God, if nothing else, let us come away with a passion for your word today. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. I'm telling you my life story to some extent, and I, I can't stop teaching, so it's my life story in a teaching format. This is the last Sunday that we celebrate Black History Month, and I, I'm old, I wanted to do this because I have enough history, more than most of you in the room, because I'm 72 years old. You're supposed to, you're supposed to say, what? And I've had the privilege in the last few months of working with my, my peers, the seniors. And what was so funny, we had one of our planning meetings, and I told Dr. Joshua, I said, now listen, I don't mind working with the seniors, but I ain't trying to be branded with no old people because I'm, you know, I'm trying to be young and all. <laughs> so when we had our meeting, I was the oldest one in the meeting. They are a fun bunch, and we're going to continue to work together, even though I'm going to be heading the women's department. I don't believe in having silo organizations where it's just us and them. We're all going to work together. We're going to work with the seniors and the marriage and everybody, because that's what God would require. But listen, I was 14 years old when they passed the Civil Rights Act of 1964. It was like a second emancipation. Because all of a sudden, I'm from the South, so we, I remember my dad had to go to the back of the Dairy Queen to pick up his hamburger. You couldn't buy, you couldn't just go to the front counter and buy things. And, and at the local bus station, we had to sit in the back of the bus when we went on a trip. And there was a sign, I'll never forget the sign. The sign was like this and it says, colored. I mean, the colored, you use that one, that, you couldn't use the white bathroom. Let me just say this today, I wanna put all the white people at ease. This is not a white folks bashing message. This, is, ain't, a, this ain't, a, ain't an awful message. This is a ain't God awful message, all right? So I just want you to, like, take a deep breath. That's going to be okay. In 1968, they consolidated the high school where I went, and I had, uh, it was, when we heard the news, I was quite alarmed uh, because I had been voted president of our class, senior class, and I couldn't wait to be bossing everybody around or just enjoying that. And then when they consolidated it, Everybody said, oh my, that's too bad, because if you had stayed at the black high school, you would have been the class valedictorian. And uh, so I was like, oh well, I assumed that all of the things that I had looked forward to at my school uh, would, would, would go away. You know the rest of the story. I was the class valedictorian. And as I saw God began to make exceptions and, and show himself strong in areas that I didn't suspect, I developed a whole new mindset. You see, I think that life is like a stool. It has, it has a base and, and four legs. Life is like that stool. And so when you think about it, in your mind, 
I just want you to get a picture of it in your mind for those of you who, who will listen to this the audio only in the sanctuary we're looking at a picture but life is like a stool and I want to challenge everybody to think about this a stool on this stool you have some core beliefs and they flow down and impact the four pillars of your life the relational the emotional the financial the physical and if I were to ask you this morning to just draw your stool what would it look like? Were all your legs balanced? Do you have core beliefs, Bible-based beliefs that inform all of your thoughts and your behavior? Now listen, let me just put you at ease. Everybody came in here limping. Everybody has a leg of that stool that's not quite, you have all the victory in that area. But you have to realize then though that all behavior comes out of a belief system. And if I were to look at this, and so much has been said already that confirms I'm supposed to talk about what I'm talking about is that when I look at my core beliefs, I believe in church fellowship. I believe in coming to church. Gabriella said it. I believe you need to not uh, uh, forsake assembling yourself together. You need a spiritual family. So I'm, I'm applauding all of you who are here today. You need a spiritual family. When somebody in your family dies or you just need prayer, sometimes your relatives may not be the ones to get the prayer through for you. And so it's one of my core beliefs that I need to be connected to a body. When I look at the stool, the, the legs of my stool, I'm thinking that, you know, it's one of my core beliefs emotionally that I am not going to tolerate what I call circumstantial depression, getting depressed because of a set of circumstances, because I really do believe that everything works together for my good. Now, that scripture didn't say, and we would understand it. It just says we just have to know it. And so I, I just, you know, people say, oh, you're so up all the time. I am up all the time. And let me tell you, I have not had an easy time. I've been cut from head to toe. I've had eight, eight surgeries. I've been cut eight times, including brain surgery. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I, I had a condition that was called trigeminal neuralgia. It was the most painful disease known to man. And I, I, I developed it right as I left my job. I'm like, God, this is not funny, because if I had stayed on my job, I would have had sick leave and all that stuff. And... Um, <laughs> And, and the worst part was, I, I, I could, keep in mind, I quit my job to go out and write and speak. I could be talking, and all of a sudden, the, the train would be so great, I couldn't do nothing else. I had to do it like this. And I said, God, I'm not going to cancel a thing. If you want me up there talking like that, y'all believe Jesus for your healing. Fine. <laughs> Fine. I'll do that. I'll do that. And you know what? God used that time. He just worked so many miracles. I got my first international interview during that time. I had no medicine. I just prayed that my mouth wouldn't shut down while I was there. And you know what? It never did because God is faithful and all things work together for my good. Physically, I believe I'm a custom job. I, I, I think I was formed in my mother's womb to do, his, to do God's pleasure. Formed, deliberately shaped. Everything about me is how God wanted me to be. That's why I haven't cut on nothing to change it yet. Now, I ain't saying I won't later, but I'm just saying. Relationally, I believe that I'm supposed to be a peacemaker. See, these are beliefs. So, so I don't like strife. I don't like to argue. I want to be a peacemaker because I know that that's where per, the unity is, is, is the place of power. So I want to stay in unity with people. But I don't believe in just keeping quiet for peace sake because that ain't in the Bible. So that's why I teach people to confront without offending. Y'all follow me today? You have to have some core beliefs so that you can have a good quality of life. Now, let me tell you something. Today, I want to talk about walking in supreme confidence. There's so many people trying to develop more confidence. But there's a scripture in 2 Corinthians 9, 8. And I love it because, listen, anytime you feel inadequate and everybody feels inadequate, in some way. Uh, I, I'm not, not quoting Oprah as an icon of spiritual wisdom or anything, but I'm, she said that in her 29 years when she was, had her show, that she had interviewed thousands and thousands of people, and the common thread was that everybody felt a sense of inadequacy. See, here's the deal. We are inadequate. And I always say when you're feeling anxiety and all that, that's your flesh telling you you are inadequate. You need to just settle that, that apart from God, you are indeed inadequate. So what? He's not limited to what you know, and I'll get to that later. But in 2 Corinthians 9, 8, it says, And God is able to make all grace. Now listen, I want you to listen to these absolutes in this scripture. God is able to make all grace abound towards you so that you, 
always hmm, having all sufficiency in all things may have an abundance for every good work. I love those absolutes. Only God can make a statement about that. Absol always, all the time, you're going to always be sufficient. You're going to always be sufficient. Now, I want to just take a minute and let us personalize that because you don't need to leave that out there with just a you. You need to say, this is for me. So let's, I want you to help me to personalize it. And God is able, I need, I need you to repeat after me, and God is able to make all grace abound towards me so that I always, having all sufficiency, may abound in every good work. Now, the reason I set you up for that, because many of you, we need you, to, we need you to volunteer when we have our expo. And some of you will say, no, listen, I can't do that. I'm not a leader. Listen, nobody is smart. You just need to show up and do what God asks you to do. You see, many of us believe that our limitations are God's limitations. Now, that's tweetable. Write that down. We believe that our limitations are God's limitations. We believe that our limitations are God's limitations. I can't be a small group leader because I don't have had any leadership skills. That's learned behavior. You're not born with that stuff. You know what? Even before I began my corporate career, I, I had an incident when I was uh, graduated from college, and I, the, our English teacher called me in, and he says, um, you and Miss Patmore, who didn't look like me, have tied for the A in the class, and you're going to have to be re-examined so we can see who will get the A. Now, I don't know why he couldn't give a one A, but when I got my grade, I had the B. I had the B. Well, listen, I, I refuse to be circumstantially depressed. And so I said, listen, then I just got to tighten this area up so nobody will ever make more than I can make on an English exam. Listen, I read English books from my pastime. We used to get ready to go on a trip. Darnell grabbed his novel, I grabbed the English book. And you know what? Because it was a setup. I didn't know God. 25 years later, he would call me to write books. I never thought I'd write books. I thought I would just do financial statements all my life. I, I love that. That's my little comfort zone. But you know what? I got a, a traditional publisher, and they let me turn my books in to the, at the last minute. Because you know what? They said, we don't, have to, we don't have to fix yours like we have to fix other people's. See, God, that was a setup. That was a setup. Listen, over my 35 years, the discrimination was real, and it was real depressing. But you know what? I learned that you shouldn't sulk and pout when things just didn't go your way. You got to keep playing the game. And God gives you the grace to do it. I love that word grace. That means divine empowerment. He divinely empowers me when I want to call people names and cuss them out. Well, I don't want to cuss nobody out no more. But I, I, that's what I'm saying, you know. But... I just, want, I, just, I just want to be what God wants me to be. And listen, sometimes our stool really looks a different way. You know that nice little stool I just showed you that was all balanced and the legs were balanced? Well, listen, some people's stools look another way. You see, sometimes we have embraced worldly beliefs, worldly views, and I'm challenging you this morning to really do an audit of your, of your beliefs. What are you really believing? What do you believe about God's ability to work through what you already know? What do you believe in? Because you see, sometimes we believe that even financially, that if I tithe, uh, I'm going to have less. You see, that's one of the biggest lies that Satan has perpetrated on the church, that if you tithe, you're going to have less. What makes you think God needs your money? Listen, and I say this with all humility. In our 43.8 years of marriage, Darnell and I have never not paid our tithes. We have never missed paying our tithes. Now, we know that's the grace of God because there were times we needed to use that money for something else, especially once we were buying a house, and we said, well, if we just save our tithes a few times, we'll have, we can fill the gap. We can just do that. And you know what? God just worked a miracle the day the transaction closed. We don't know how all the money got in. I called the escort and said, how is it going? They said, all the money is in. You see, when you walk in supreme confidence like that and God's ability to meet the need, he will do stuff that will just blow your mind. He will surround you with all kind of favors. So we got to get in touch with those beliefs that are not in alignment with God's word. And let me tell you something. I found that men, I'm just going to say this when I'm, I'm just talking about walking in confidence. I was a CFO at a church and I hired a controller and we had a certain system. And I said, listen, uh, you know how to work this system, right? He said, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Well, the first day on the job, he says, where is the, where is the manual? I'm like, the manual? He said, yeah. I said, you know, you know the system already, right? He says, oh, I couldn't be that hard. He wasn't even saved. He had more faith than a lot of Christians. And I want to speak to the women especially, because I learned this from men. Men will apply for a job if they only have half the qualifications. When a man sees required on a job qualification list, he sees desired. That, that's just what they desire. Yeah, they may say required. Women won't. Listen, we got to have all the credentials. We got to take one more class. We got to have four degrees in it and all of that. Listen, I'm challenging you women to step outside of your comfort zone and just begin to ask for what you want. Ask for what you want. Because God will show himself strong. When I left my job 16 years ago, and I was thinking, I had some wrong beliefs, just like that stool you saw. I had some wrong beliefs. I said, now, God, I don't really want to go do this full time because two reasons. Uh, I, I heard that white people don't buy books that are written by black folks. They devalue black intellect. That's not true. I don't believe in painting anybody with a broad brush. But I said, I understand white people don't buy black folks' books. And secondly, black folks don't read enough to be, to be trying to make a living selling books. <laughs> Didn't I say that, Darnell? <laughs> but let me just show you what God has done. Sometimes I go into airports and, 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 and different places, and I see these racks. And, and I was in one not too long ago, uh, right before COVID, and, there, and I just stood there in awe of God. I, I, I saw my books there with, um, with, um, with, with, with uh, show, me the, show me the chart, T.D. Jakes and, and, and Tony Evans and, and, and John Maxwell, and they're my book over there, 30 Days to a Struck. You know what? I'm so humbled when I see something like that. I'm, I'm almost doing it like this. I'm like, for real? I'm like that guy on Andy Griffith. All you young people don't know who Andy Griffith is. But, but Gomer Powell said, golly! And that's how I feel. That's how I feel. And listen, God has been so good. And, and white people have been nice to me. Okay, I'm giving encouraged to white people. White people have been really nice to me. Let me tell you. When I... Um, I got, I got a call to go on uh, Marilyn Hickey's show. Somebody wanted, uh, Sarah uh, uh, liked one of my books. And Marilyn Hickey's on in over 103 countries, 130 countries every day. And they said, can you come to Denver and, and tape a show? And I'm thinking like, Denver? I, now, don't y'all take my word of faith papers, but I don't like flying. And, I, and my worst airport is Denver. I don't fly to Denver. So I, I immediately want, wasn't going to do it. And I said, do y'all ever come to LA and do any tapings? And they said, no, the studio is in Denver. I'm like, and I went to God, and he says, the place you fear is where your blessing is. And I went to Denver, and I've been on that show about 16 times. Because God will surround you with favor like a shield. You got to read that. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't care what your what you are. You can be black, you can be, listen, when I graduated from high school, the word was that you have three strikes against you if you are a woman, if you are black, and if you are dark-skinned black. Oh, I was struck out and I haven't even got started. <laughs> Let me tell you, God is not limited by stats and facts and, stat and all that stuff. He's not limited by that. Let me tell you about walking in supreme confidence. The word confidence means with trust, with trust. Con means with, fit means trust, with trust. Here's why I don't like self-confidence. Do if, if confidence means with trust, what do you think self-confidence means? With trust in self. If you do a Google search, you'll find that there have been over 750 million searches on the word self-confidence because we're always looking for a way to depend on self. We need to know that we can control things. We don't really like walking by faith. You know, sometimes I think that's why I, I believe in tithing, giving, being generous, because I don't, I don't wanna walk by, I, I wanna know how my finances are covered, and I feel like when I do that, I'm insuring myself against lack, honestly. I just feel like I'm insuring myself against lack. I, that's, that's just me, now, there ain't no scripture called that. But listen, I love personal development, and the first part of my life, I spent so much time doing personal development. I had a class in everything. 
I even went to professional modeling school, knowing I wasn't going to stop eating Oreos, but I went to professional modeling school and, and learned all the finishing and all that proper stuff. I wanted to know how to be appropriate in any setting. If I go to the White House, I know what to do. If I go to the outhouse, I know what to do. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> the Bible says, Proverbs 28, 26, he who trusts in self, hmm, he who trusts in self is a fool. Do you really want to trust in yourself? Listen, self is a hard taskmaster. It's a hard taskmaster. It's like living on batteries. Many years ago, uh, when they didn't have um, the electrical outlets in, on, in coach on the planes, you know, where you couldn't plug in your stuff, I used to just be anxious before we landed. I'd be anxious before we landed because I didn't know if my battery was going to run out on the plane, on, on the phone before I landed. Maybe somebody's picking me up, and now I'm not going to have, they may, if I, <laughs> it was just so anxiety producing. But then when I would get to the hotel and plug it in, I wasn't running over there every few minutes going, oh, let's see if that electricity is going to last. Because that's what we got to do. We got to plug in. You got to plug in in your head so that you understand what God is doing, what God is doing. And let me tell you something. Confidence is rooted in knowing that God has you covered. You know, many people say confidence is rooted in knowledge. But they mean human knowledge. That's not enough. That's not enough. In, in, in 2 Corinthians 3, 5, I love this scripture. This is one of my hallmark beliefs that guide my life. And it says, not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think, y'all look at that, look at that, of anything as being from ourselves, but our sufficiency is from God. I love that. You see, adequacy doesn't emanate from you. It flows through you. And when I'm feeling most inadequate, it, we're going to always feel inadequate. I'm telling you because we are. Even today, when, when I was preparing last night, I think it was up to like 2 in the morning. But I just sometimes stand in the mirror and I just do this to remind myself, adequacy flows through me, not from me. It's okay to bank a lot of knowledge, but don't bank on the knowledge. Don't bank on the knowledge. Let me tell you why not to bank on the knowledge. When I worked for Hughes Aircraft and they had hired me because they needed a black person in a certain position, I, I didn't know the job, but they just say, here's one, because they had to get government contracts. And so they said, we'll give you a tutor. We just need a black person in a high visibility spot. So I'm like, okay, I don't mind being the token black person, but you get benefits for being the token black. I just bring the other blacks along with me. I'm good with that. Mm -hmm. So I remember, though, when they called me to the corporate office, and you, some of you may remember this story, but they called me to the corporate office one day, and they said, they want to interview you because we understand you're a former venture capitalist, and we're doing this acquisition. We want to make sure that we record it properly on the books. I don't know what they're talking about. I went to the corporate office because they didn't tell me until I got to work that day, and I prayed in the spirit all the way there because I don't know anything about this thing that they're going to ask me about. But let me tell you, folks, the man was interviewing me, and I felt the tangible presence of God. Speaking to me, a download. Listen, that man was mesmerized. I was too. And <laughs> he was leaning forth in his seat, and at the end of the interview, he said, where did you learn all that? Well, being from Texas, I want to say, right here, right now. That's what I want to tell him. That's where I learned it, right here, right now, on the spot. Because God will give you a now experience. He will give you a now experience. You know what I mean? When Daniel, y'all remember the story of Daniel in the lion's den? Not the lion's den. Daniel, when he first came to Babylon, in first Daniel 1 and 2. Great story. He was a captive. He was a captive. He came to Babylon. He didn't know the culture, any of that. But God had given him a gift. He knew how to interpret dreams. But there came a day when the king had a dream. And the king couldn't remember what the dream was. Daniel didn't know how to discern a dream. He knew how to interpret a dream. So the king said, I'm going to kill all the wise men unless y'all tell me what I dream. But here is the best example I can find of supreme confidence. They had already started to kill the wise men. But Daniel, bold as he was, he went to the head of security and said, what's up? Why is this so, so, why is this so urgent? They said, because it's bothering the king. He, he wants to know what it was. Daniel goes in and he says, if you give me some time, I will tell you what you dream and what it meant. Now listen, y'all, there will come a time when the demands are just greater than you have the ability to do. But he knew that if he could spend some time, you know, time like y'all spent uh, Friday night, mm -hmm. time, 
He was convinced. He was totally convinced that time with God will, will reveal the answer, and God did it. You'll read about it. I don't have time to tell you the whole thing, but God revealed it. But he came out of his prayer closet. He said, blessed be the name of God forever and forever, for wisdom and might are his. And he goes on in verse 23, and he says, I want to thank you, God, that you have given me wisdom and might, and you have made known to me now the thing that I desired. And sometimes I've been in a situation where I say, God, I just need a now experience. I need you to tell me right now, I, this knowledge ain't baked. This knowledge ain't, I know the Holy Spirit will bring things to your remembrance, but I ain't never had it up there to bring back, so I just need you to do it afresh. And he will do it. I remember when we were doing the financing for West Angeles Church, and it was the, we were building the cathedral. How many of you have seen that cathedral, that big thing? That was my project. And so my job was to get the financing, negotiate it. And I was in a meeting with the banks, and they were asking stuff I didn't quite know about. And I'm like, Lord, just give me something smart to say. <laughs> like you did at Hughes. When, remember, Lord, when I worked at Hughes, and you downloaded all that information? Give me something like that. Nothing. See, God won't let you put him in a box. He's just going to work the way he works. And I'm sitting there, and I'm like, okay, then just give me a question to ask. So God gave me a question, and they said, oh, you're ahead of us. I almost fainted. I'm saying, I am so far behind you, we want to track. <laughs> you would run into the back of me. That's how far behind you I am. God is good. We got to expect God to be faithful. We got to expect God to be faithful. You know, uh, there's a, a, a fish, there's a fish called a, a remora that demonstrates how we should be connected to God and be confident enough to say, no matter what, I'm connecting to God. And this fish is called a remora, and it attaches itself to the underbelly of a shark. This thing is so fascinating, y'all. It attaches itself to the underbelly of the shark, shark and, and, and it feeds on what comes out of the shark's mouth. It has, on its head, it has a suction cup that allows him to stay connected. Are y'all seeing the parallels? The Holy Spirit connects us with God like that. And let me tell you, this thing can go anywhere in the sea. It has no enemies because an enemy of the Bravori is an enemy of the shark, just like an enemy of us is an enemy of God. And you don't have to worry about it. All you gotta do is stay connected. That's all you gotta do is stay connected. And as I was looking at this and studying this thing, I'm thinking, you know, many times we don't really stop and remind ourselves that we are connected to a God who knows everything, is all powerful and always present. Can you imagine that? You know, I have to just come out of my mind sometimes. See, sometimes we just need to lose our senses. We gotta come out of that sense realm thinking and just do a reset. And I said, I'm gonna let my mind go on the word of God. That's why I firmly believe in memorizing the word of God because we learned in physics that no two forms of matter can occupy the same space at the same time. So this, this anxiety, this anxiety, this expectation of a negative outcome cannot sit there when I'm declaring the word of God. It just can't sit there. Not even thoughts about racism and, and all of that. You know, somebody asked me the other day, do I think that the people, black people as a race will ever be just one? I said, I don't know if I'll see that in my lifetime, but I do know that every person who will believe God, he's going to see a change in his life, and God's going to do something miraculous. God's going to do, I challenge you with that today. Because let me tell you, nobody can thwart God's purpose for your life. Nobody can thwart God's purpose. Final scripture I want to give you today is in Isaiah 14, 27. Man, this scripture is so powerful, it'll just make you almost honorary. <laughs> Here's what it says. For the Lord Almighty has purposed, and who can thwart him? Now, when I meditate the scriptures, I do every word. The Lord Almighty. But when I got to that who, when I got to that who, I want to shout. Because you know what who means? What person? Name one somebody that can thwart God's purpose for your life. No, no, all you can do is set me up for a miracle. You can't do it. It says his hand is outstretched. Who can turn it back? Who can turn it back? Can gender discrimination turn it back? Can age discrimination turn it back? No, no. So when the enemy comes at you and bombards you with these thoughts of inadequacy, especially because you're black or, or you're disadvantaged, nobody can disadvantage me. I actually had a boss that the Lord just killed him off. He just killed him. He just killed him, y'all. He just killed him. <laughs> so, so I'm like, you know, I, was, I, I, I can't say I was real sad. I was just like, oh, well, you know, just, oh, well. 
Nobody can thwart God's plan for your life. And I know there are many of you today sitting out there, and you may not have done something. You may have just stopped in your tracks because you thought you were inadequate. And I want to pray for you. I want to pray for every person in this room, and I know it's probably everybody. So I'm just going to ask everybody to stand, and I just want to pray for you, those of you who might just want to kind of like just step aside just a little bit. You don't have to come down to the altar. Our time is well spent. But I tell you, God is looking for an opportunity to show himself strong. And I'm just believing, God, that you're going to go out and do something different. First of all, you're going to learn the word of God on a whole new level. You're going to write it down. I, when I go out and walk, I have it written down. I'm memorizing scripture because I'm banking this. I need that when the enemy comes, when the devil comes and say, you're inadequate. The Bible says, agree quickly with your adversary. I say, you are correct. I am inadequate in my own strength. Apart from God, I can do nothing, but with him, I can do everything. And I'm excited about stuff that I'm not, I don't know what to do. I, I deliberately put myself in situations where I'm the, I'm the least of. I'm just the least of. And sometimes I look around the room and I'm like, what in the world am I doing here? Because God wanted me there. And let me tell you, he has things for you. Raise your hands if you were that person this morning. You know, you just know you need it. I told all of y'all to stand because I want anybody standing up. I know that sometimes people don't like to admit that they have inadequacies. In fact, I wrote this book, 30 Days to a Stronger, More Confident You. The original title was Conquering Insecurity. But guess what? Wouldn't nobody buy it. They didn't want to be seen reading a book called Conquering Insecurity. But let me tell you something. If you will admit that you have been held back in your mind, you thought you were inadequate and you were right, not that you're sufficient of yourself to think of anything as being from yourself. Father God, in the name of Jesus, I want to thank you this morning for reminding us, God, that you are the vine. God, if we stay attached to you, there is no limit to what we can do. Lord, we thank you for the privilege, the privilege of being your child. God, help us to remember always that you are omniscient, omnipotent, and I'm not present. God, that knowledge is too big for us to comprehend. So, Lord, we believe, but help our unbelief. Cause us, oh God, to step out, to be bold, to volunteer, to, Lord, just to step into that realm and know that you're going to meet us. Because you promised to surround us with favor like a shield when we are righteous, when we're in right standing with you. So we say yes this morning. We say yes this morning, oh God. We say yes. And forgive us for thinking that somebody, that racism held us back. We just thought that, God. We don't have to use it as an excuse for inaction. But God, today we leave boldly. Even as people of color, we leave boldly knowing that nobody can thwart your purpose for our lives. So we say yes to you today. We love you, we appreciate you, and we thank you for the privilege of being your children. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.